Hello and welcome to another of the screencasts and today we'll be talking about anatomy and physiology and predominantly the cardiac output. So let's get started. In essence what we're talking about is the heart's ability to provide the body with the blood that it needs. And cardiac output is described as the amount of blood that's pumped by the heart in one minute. The reason that it's important for us to know what this is is usually used as a measure of fitness, so especially for endurance athletes, so for example long distance runners, cyclists or swimmers of a, a long distance. Because we're talking about blood and how quickly it can transport around the body, we're also talking about how quickly we can move oxygen around the body and also get rid of waste products. So that's why endurance athletes tend to focus on this as a measure of their fitness. So what's cardiac output actually made up of? Well the calculation is relatively straightforward and it's our heart rate, which is the amount of times the heart beats per minute. This is also known as BPM, which I'm sure you know about. And also the stroke volume. This is the amount of blood forced out of the aorta or the ventricles per beat. So depending on how strong your heart can contract will depend on how much volume of blood is forced out of the ventricles and around the body. This is also known as a SV and this is usually measured in uh, milliliters. So as you can see here we've got the two average numerical values and on average our heart beats about 72 times per minute and that's also known as BPM and the amount of blood that's forced out from the ventricles into the body is about 70 milliliters for your average person so how we actually work out what our cardiac output is which is also known as Q is the beats per minute times the stroke volume so in this instance we've got 72 beats per minute times 70 milliliters that equals 5,040 milliliters, or in other words, around about 5 liters. So that gives you your average cardiac output uh, at rest. Clearly that's going to change quite dramatically when we're doing exercise, but we'll look at that at a slightly later stage. So what we're going to talk about here is how the blood actually moves from our working muscles through the veins back into the heart and out again into the working muscles and we're just looking at the process that it goes through within the chambers and, and we'll identify what active and passive filling actually are so let's get started so initially what will happen is we'll have a passive filling of this atrial here and it's known as the atrial diastolic phase so the blood will be moving from the veins into this chamber without there being any heart contractions. So all of this is in the relaxing phase of the, the heart contraction. And that allows all the blood to move into this initial chamber. So once we've got a high intensity of blood in that particular area, what will happen is we will have blood moving from an area of high concentration to low concentration which would be down in the ventricles here. Again this is only forced open in a passive way. There's no heart contraction at this stage. We're still in the relaxing phase so the heart is relaxed but the blood has moved from here into here. As you can see there it's clearly stated atrial diastole. Diastolic is the relaxation and atrial is where it is. So it's the atrial diastolic phase, passive filling. And then on this one here we've got ventricle diastole, diastole still mean relaxing, and then ventricle which is this chamber here. So we can see um, see how sort of like just by knowing what, what it's called will hopefully give us an understanding of what's actually happening. So what will happen then is as the stages move on we'll have atrial systole so we know where it's happening which is the atria 
here and here um, but this is systolic phase and therefore it is active so what we'll have is a contraction of the heart removing the remaining blood uh, re remaining blood from the atria here down into the ventricles once this area is now full of the blood the valves will close up the next stage will be the ventricular systole again so we know that this is an active uh, an active filling and it's occurring in the ventricles so what will happen here is the lower parts of the heart will contract forcing this blood now out of the ventricles and into the relevant areas so um, obviously for this one here it will be forcing the deoxygenated blood off into the lungs so the ventricles are now forcing the blood actively taking the blood away hence the fact it's systole okay so all of the blood doesn't actually get removed when these contractions take place and we are left with some uh, elements of blood in each one of the different stages and we need to know what these are these are uh, these uh, occurrences are actually called and the first one is called the EDV or the end diastolic volume so after the diastolic phase what's left at the end so in essence the EDV is the amount of blood that is left in the ventricles at the end of the relaxation phase so once we've had this diastolic occurrence so this relaxation phase how much blood has been left within the ventricles and if we could measure that that will give us our EDV the end diastolic volume we also need to know what this is which is the ESV and principally we're talking about the ventricles and the systolic phase so this systolic phase was active so we're trying to work out what the how much blood is left in the ventricles after the systolic phase of contraction so once these ventricles have forced the blood out uh, to the relevant areas how much blood actually remains and this is known in our, as our ESV our end systolic volume so I think the question is why is it important that we need to know what our EDV and our ESV are? Well, let's just say this, that the average person can usually force out about 60% of the blood within their ventricles. So if we can actually measure what the, the ventricles are able to force out, once we've trained and we measure again, we can establish whether our heart is actually getting stronger. So if you think of the heart, obviously as a muscle, and it being a strong muscle, it, after it's being trained, it'll be able to force more blood out, and therefore we would have a reduction in our ESV. So our ESV will be a good measure of how strong our heart is. And also with the EDV, this will measure and be able to tell us how well we're able to return blood into the atria. So therefore we could establish if our venous return is good as well both of these will have an impact on our ability to move oxygen, oxygen around the body. So in this section we're very quickly going to look at how this, um, this knowledge could manifest within an exam question. So the question above there is describe the changes that take place to stroke volume from rest to exercise levels and we're looking for potentially three marks. So let's, uh, let's see how that, that would actually unfold. Um, we could argue very quickly that our stroke volume would increase and the reason for this is more blood is being pumped out per beat due to an increase in demand. Another potential part of the answer would be that during submaximal exercise, your stroke volume reaches a maximum value. There's only so much blood that your heart is actually able to push out. And I think at the absolute extreme, it's about 200 milliliters. So there's a, there's a finite level, you can't go any further. Um, and one of the things that can happen is your stroke volume can go down during exercise. And this is where the, the heart rate is kicking over so quickly that there's no time for the ventricles to fill completely. 
So when you get to a certain point, your stroke volume may decline as your heart rate increases. And we'll have a look at that in our session. But just to show you how that would potentially look on a graph, as you can see there that the heart rate is clearly rising up and up and up and also was the stroke volume but then we get to a certain point where your heart's like hang on I can't fill up the ventricles quick enough for me to keep continually rising so the heart rate increases to compensate for this lack of blood that's being forced out per beat okay so that ends the cardiac output uh, I'd like you to have a look at Stalin's law and see how that would impact venous return and we'll look at that in one of our sessions. Okay, thanks.